Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Donna Linewan Lege, the 102nd president of the National Press Club. We are delighted to have you listening or viewing or in the, in the room with us today as we hear from Air Force Secretary Heather Wilson on the newly proposed Space Force and the issues facing the U.S. Air Force today. If you are on Twitter, we do encourage you to tweet during the program. Please use the hashtag NPCLive and feel free to tweet your questions. We'll ask as many questions as time allows. For our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences, please be aware that in the audience today are members of the general public, so any applause you may hear or any reaction is not necessarily from working journalists. And I will be introducing our head table, skipping over our speaker. Please hold your applause until all the people on the head table have been introduced. So we will get started. Um, on my left, we have John Gallagher, Senior Americas Correspondent at IHS Fair Play and a member of the NPC Headliners uh, team. Jillian Rich, Aerospace Defense and Space Reporter at Investors Business Daily. Vago Moradian, Editor at Defense and Aerospace Report. Michael E. Martin, Public Affairs Advisor to the Secretary of the U.S. Air Force. Tony Capaccio, <laughs> Pentagon Reporter at Bloomberg. Brigadier General Ed Thomas, Director of Public Affairs at the U.S. Air Force. There's me, hi. Um, Kevin Wensing, Captain, uh, U.S. Navy retired, Chair at FCA Americas and the National Press Club member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, skipping over our speaker just for a minute, Amanda Macias, National Security Correspondent and CNBC. Ali Murray, Special Assistant and Chief of Staff to the Secretary of the U.S. Air Force. Steve Trimble. Defense Editor at Aviation Week, Max Letterer, Publisher at Stars and Stripes, and finally, Mike McMurray, representing the National Press Club's American Legion Post and a retired Naval officer. Please also join me, join me in acknowledging additional members of the headliners team responsible for organizing today's event. Betsy Fisher Martin, Lori Russo, Tamara Hinton, Bill Lord, Danny Selnick, and the Press Club staff, especially Lindsay Underwood, Laura Coker, and Executive Director William McCarran. As President Trump travels the country promoting candidates for the upcoming midterm elections, one of the topics he frequently mentions is his plan to establish a sixth branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Two weeks ago, the United States Air Force, led by Secretary Heather Wilson, our speaker today, delivered to the Pentagon a proposal detailing the structure of a Space Force military department which is to be included in the administration's fiscal year 2020 budget. To establish this new combat command, the proposal noted, will require an estimated $13 billion over five years um, in added defense funding. It will also add another 13,000 employees to the federal payroll, including a new service secretary. Just last week, Secretary Wilson asserted in a speech that we can no longer view space as a function. It is a war-fighting mission. She also called it a mission which requires a separate department that, I quote, puts a warfighter's focus on space, space operations. As she begins defending what is already considered by some to be politically contentious, Secretary Wilson bring, brings decades of experience in the military, politics, and public affairs. Hoping to become a pilot like her father and her grandfather, the Keene, New Hampshire native graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1982 as part of the school's third graduating class to include women. 
She earned a Rhodes Scholarship and upon graduation opted to study at Oxford instead of claiming her, spa her spot in uh, flight school. She served as an Air Force officer until 1989 when she joined the National Security Council as Director for Defense. Uh, at, well, defense Policy and Arms Control for President George H.W. Bush. In 1998, Wilson resigned a New Mexico cabinet post to enter the Republican primary. She won a special election that fall and became the first U.S. veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces to serve in Congress. While there, she didn't hesitate to vote independent of her party, particularly on social issues including requiring federal workers, worker health plans to cover contraceptives and opposing an amendment to ban adoptions by gay parents in Washington, D.C. Secretary Wilson, who was nominated by President Trump and sworn into office on May 16th of last year, uh, now oversees the Air Force's annual budget of more than $138 billion. Speaking today, she will uh, talk about the uh, future of American air power in the 21st century. Secretary Wilson will fill us in on what it will take to get the Air Force that, uh, that the United States currently has to the Air Force that she believes the United States is going to need over the next decade. Please give a warm press club welcome to the 24th Secretary of the U.S. Air Force, Heather Wilson. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Uh, since this is the press club, I'm going to start out by, by correcting the record on at least one thing, and that is that, uh, that uh, I was actually not, obviously not the first veteran in the Congress, but I also was not the first woman veteran to serve. There was, a, there was a, from I think the state of Maryland, a woman who succeeded her husband, but then was not reelected to a full term. Uh, but she, uh, she was a nurse in, nurse in, in World War II. Uh, and since then, of course, we've had other women veterans who are serving, and it's, it's really nice to get to a point in American history where that's really not a notable thing, where, uh, where women veterans are not only in the Congress, but they are in the boardroom as well as on the flight line. So, so it's a pleasure to spend a little bit of time, a uh, little bit of time with you this afternoon. Of course, today on Capitol Hill, the House of Representatives is debating the, the fiscal year 19 appropriations bill. And the authorization bill has already passed. The military construction bill has already passed. Of course, the Senate has approved the, uh, the uh, defense appropriations bill for fiscal year 19. And we are, we are that close to having a budget before the 1st of October for the Defense Department. And uh, that is... That is, um, that is a tremendous credit to the United States Congress um, and to the, the bipartisan group of, of uh, members who recognized that the lack of a budget starting in the beginning of the fiscal year is, is very difficult to deal with. And it makes a tremendous difference to have that certainty and of course also to have moved beyond uh, the Budget Control Act and sequester at least for this kind of two-year agreement. Um, and uh, that certainty will allow us to move forward quickly into the fiscal year and continue the high pace of operations with some certainty on what we can expect over the next year. Before taking questions, I'd like to highlight a couple of things, talk about a couple of things and priorities for the service. Um, first and more, most important is the top objective of the United States Air Force and really the Department of Defense as a whole under Secretary Mattis, and that is the restoration of the readiness of the force. When I returned to, uh, to federal service, I had been away from national security for a time. I had, I, while I worked on it in the Congress, I, uh, I was uh, the president of a university in South Dakota, South Dakota School of Mines, so I was, I was focused on inflicting calculus on young adults instead of, uh, instead of studying national security things. Uh, but one of the things that, that um, there, were, there were a number of things that surprised me coming back to the service. And one was the decline in readiness levels of our forces. And, um, and so it was, it was clear to me, as it is I think to most people in the Pentagon, that restoring the readiness of the force had to be our number one priority. 
This last spring, the Chief of Staff and I, General Goldfein, asked a group of people from across the service to come together, about 50 people, and they spent six weeks together in a windowless basement build of the uh, room of the Pentagon, looking at readiness, and not just in a superficial way, but really doing a deep dive on readiness. What, is, what are we measuring to assess readiness? How do we resource readiness? What are the changes we need to make? What are the barriers to improved readiness? And they developed a, a pretty comprehensive understanding and also a plan um, to move forward. It is the resources that the Congress has provided and that, that are, were put into the President's budget um, that are helping us to, to turn the corner. We added 4,000 people to the end strength of the Air Force, and that allowed us to start to fill in holes that were stripped out of the service in the wake of, of sequester, uh, in, in cyber, in maintenance, in logistics. In September of 2016, the Air Force was short 4,000 maintainers, just completely short of those maintainers. We prioritized recruiting maintainers and starting to fill out the force to make sure we had enough people to maintain our aircraft. As a result, uh, as of the end of the last fiscal year, we were only 400 maintainers short, and by December of this year, we will be back up and even. Uh, we, won't be, uh, we will have eliminated the gap, and we will have no more shortage in maintainers. Now, of course, you can't replace someone who has 15 years of experience as a maintainer with somebody who's brand new. There is the seasoning that goes on and the experience of the force. So we have, we have while we have enough people for maintainers, we, uh, we have to season and develop those, those uh, experts into uh, those apprentices into, into master craftsmen over a period of time. But, but filling in the gaps in our force is one of the keys to restoring the readiness of the force. Because first and foremost, readiness is about people. The second element of readiness is training. And training often means creating the, what, the, what the airmen call the white space on the calendar. Enough space and time to be able to, to, to train for what we call the high-end fight. And we've been working to, uh, to reduce some of the demands overseas, particularly on our air crew, so that we have a better chance to retain those airmen and they have a better opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, train here at home uh, for, the for the high end fight. That also means things like increasing flying hours so that, uh, that airmen can have more sorties per month to actually get after the training that they, that they need to do. With respect to training, one of the things that we are also focused on is making sure that we have the simulation and the training aids and the, uh, the things on our ranges to be able to simulate the environments that, w that, a, that air crew will face um, in a peer or near peer environment. Because we've optimized ourselves over the last 27 years of continuous combat operations for the fight against violent extremism, where we have continuous air superiority and where we control the rheostat of time. Um, we cannot anticipate that warfare in the future will be like that. And so we have to be able to train for the high end fight. As a result of the things that we have done over the last 18 to 24 months, the Air Force is more ready today for major combat operations than we were two years ago. And more than 75% of our primary, our primary pacing forces is combat, are combat ready today uh, with their lead force packages. So we are restoring the readiness of the force. But we have a long way to go and we need to be consistent in our focus on restoration of readiness. The second thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is cost-effective modernization. We are trying to buy things faster and smarter. I mentioned that in the fight we've been in, we control the rheostat of time. If you control the rheostat of time in any conflict, you also can control the rheostat of innovation. Um, but we have returned to an era of great power competition, and the national defense strategy explicitly recognizes that. In, a, in an era of re-emerged great power competition, we have an adversary and a potential adversary uh, that is innovating very rapidly. And we need to buy things faster and smarter in order to maintain the advantage that the United States Air Force uh, has enjoyed 
for many decades. So how are we doing that? First, competition works. And if we are able to encourage more companies to participate in competition in, for procurement, that helps to not only drive innovation to get the best out of American industry, but also drives competitive pricing. I think all of you probably, many of you saw that yesterday when we announced uh, that, uh, that Boeing has, has won the, uh, the contract to replace the UH-1 helicopter for the Air Force. We're going to buy 84 of them. And, uh, and because of intense competition, we were able to get them at a much better price, uh, saving about, we estimate, about $1.7 billion over what we, uh, we expected to pay. Long term, um, we know that we need a robust defense industrial base in order to have meaningful competition. And we need to open ourselves up to industries that perhaps historically have not bid on projects with the United States Air Force. And so that means doing things a little bit differently. Let me give you an example of how we're trying to do that. The Congress has given us some new authorities to be able to engage in industry in different ways and to, to get beyond the very strict and very formulaic way in which acquisition has been done in the past. One of the things we've done with those so-called other transaction authorities is to build consor uh, consortia of companies to be able to work with, for example, in space. In January of this, uh, of this year, we set up a consortium out of the Space and Missile Systems Center intended to engage a lot of those companies in commercial space in supplying ideas and technology to the United States Air Force. That consortium now has over 180 companies that are participants in it. Of those 180 or so, 124 have never done business with the Defense Department before. So these are the kinds of innovative companies supplying commercial industry in a very fast-paced market segment uh, who we want to engage to potentially help the United States Air Force. In that consortium, we, it's a consortium where we've committed up to, uh, up to $500 million for, for projects that might be done in that consortium. We put out a solicitation uh, there are pro proposals that come in, and the average time between the solicitation being put out and a contract award and contract being signed is 93 days. So we're moving very quickly with small companies to get, innova get into innovation into the, into the Air Force. <clears throat> Likewise, we're also changing some of the ways we engage small business. Like every federal agency, we have certain goals that we do meet with respect to small business contracting. But we wanted to see whether there was something we could do even better. Um, and we've decided this year that we're going to, uh, we're going to start engaging small business uh, in a way that the Air Force has never done before. In fact, I don't even know of any federal agency that's done this before. If, if a small business has an idea, and as much as a PayPal account, then they should be able to do business with the United States Air Force. Here's the concept. We will put out some of our hardest problems that require exceptional innovation and, and put out the kind of solicitation and problem statement. We'll take in what amount to white papers from anybody, small businesses primarily, and invite, with, do a very quick review, a couple of weeks, and invite the leaders of those companies to come and make their pitch directly to the program executive office and program managers with the idea that if it's a good idea and business plan, if they have a good technical solution that's worth supporting, even with small amounts of money, that with a one-page contract, they will walk out with a contract and a commitment to fund that day. That's the kind of speed of business that small business really needs to be able to work with a large entity like the United States Air Force, and we're committed to moving forward with those kinds of arrangements. The third area that I would highlight is the way that we're trying to buy things faster and smarter. It has to do with prototyping and experimentation. In 2016 and 2017, the Congress put some new provisions in the National Defense Authorization Act to allow more prototyping and experimentation to be able to do things faster. The Air Force is taking advantage of those new authorities and moving out, uh, stripping years out of program plans as a result. In just the last six and a half months, the Air Force has taken 56 years out of our portfolio in our program plans. Um, 
As an example, hypersonics. Um, we, are, we are working with the Army and the Navy on prototypes for hypersonic weapons, and we intend to, the good thing about prototypes is they're time limited. So, so if you can't do it in a five-year period, it shouldn't be a prototype. But all prototypes that we're doing are intended to ultimately result in a system. So you have to have something that's not just, this is not just a, a little test. This is something we really want to see if there's a pathway forward. We're doing the same with what are called adaptive engines, as an example. In the way historically the Air Force would do procurement, if we were going to buy a new engine, we would do several years of analysis of alternatives, we would define requirements, and several years into it, all we would have are piles of paper and engineering studies, and set the requirements, and then send out a request for proposal, and people would bid on it, but we, we'd never really have any good technical data, even on whether it was possible. Instead, with adaptive engines, we contracted with two of the world's best engine companies, and we said, build us a prototype. Now, an adaptive engine, just as an example, if you had a eight-cylinder eight Corvette, cherry red, <laughs> and once you get up to speed on the highway, four of the cylinders turned off, but when you pushed on the accelerator, it had eight cylinders again. That's what an adaptive engine is. So we gave them, a, and it's the equivalent of that for a jet engine, we gave them a goal and said, see if you can build us an engine that gets a 10% increase in thrust and a 25% increase in fuel efficiency. Tough problem. Build a prototype. See what you can do. Put your best people on it. And, and so we have two companies that are doing that. At the end of that, we will know what is technically possible. We will have built prototypes and if they say, well, you know, we can get to 9% and 20% increase in fuel efficiency, we won't define that as failure because our engineering studies in advance said that those should be the requirements. So prototyping, we think, in many circumstances, is actually a much better way to do procurement because you understand the limitations in the realm of the possible from the beginning. The Air Force is using prototyping and experimentation extensively when it makes sense to do so, and we will continue to do so. The, uh, the one thing that I would say is that we also decided as a service that if we were going to take advantage of these new authorities, we had to be very transparent about it and actually increase the amount of information that we're sharing with, with both the Office of the Secretary of Defense, over overseers, and with the United States Congress so that we're, not, we're, we're buying things faster, but we're also buying them smarter and with greater transparency. And we think by doing that, uh, we, we enhance the security of the country and hopefully get, a bet, get better value for every dollar that the Air Force spends. So we are trying to move forward with cost-effective modernization. There is a bow wave of modernization that the Air Force is going through. I mentioned the helicopter. But obviously, we're, we're buying new tankers, we're buying uh, the F-35, we've got new space assets, the uh, modernization of the strategic nuclear deterrence. So there is, there is really a bow wave of modernization that the Air Force will be working through over the next decade. And our responsibility is to try to do that as cost effectively as we can to get capability from the lab bench to the warfighter faster. And with that, I would be happy to start answering questions. deal of them so we'll we'll get started so um, I'm going to start uh, with your your uh, employment picture the uh, expansion of the, squ uh, the squadrons the Air Force currently operates 312 squadrons you have said that this is not enough you want to go to I think 386 76 mm -hmm. somewhere around there and 40,000 more people how would you, by 2030, how do you uh, propose doing this, and mm. how does this reflect the changing nature of warfare? Mm. The, uh, the uh, Congress in the, I think it was in the FY18 National Defense Authorization Act, tasked a series of studies, uh, and this is the first piece of those, of those studies that are mandated by the Congress 
on, uh, on what is required to implement the national defense strategy. And so uh, we've been doing some analysis on, uh, on what's required. Every airman can tell you that they are overstretched. And I, I think we've all known this you know, for some time. I've, I've talked about it for a couple of years, that the Air Force is too small for what the nation is asking it to do. And, and the Air Force has declined significantly in size. I mean, the Air Force went to war in the Persian Gulf when I was on the National Security Council staff in 1990, 1991 and have never come home, never come home. So basically 27 straight years of combat operations that the United States Air Force has been engaged in. And at that time, and you know, in 1991, the United States Air Force had 134 fighter squadrons, 134. And today we have 55. The pace of operations is one of the things that's driving the difficulty in retention of air crew because we're, we're burning out our people. And so we, we took the first piece of this study. There was a lot more that we'll, that we'll uh, go through over the next five to six months uh, to get the final study, but the interim report uh, to Congress, we promised them in, in uh, the August, September timeframe here. And that's, that looks at, that, that study looks at, um, looks at what does the national defense strategy ask us to do? Um, how would we best do it? It does a lot of um, war gaming, modeling and simulation, uh, looking at the current operating plans uh, and what would that general mix of forces be? And, uh, and so that was, that was really the first piece of it. Um, we decided that we would share that not only with the Congress but, but more publicly uh, last week. Um, it is not intended to influence the fiscal year 20 budget. This is a long-term view um, looking at the threat and how the threat is changing so that the Air Force can, can uh, um, provide kind of a sense of where we think we need to go uh, in the 2025-2030 time frame in order to keep pace with the threat. How much of the lacking operational capacity could be filled by fully funding the readiness accounts for the existing squadrons? Mm. Um, the, uh, this year's president's budget uh, increased significantly the operations and maintenance funds to be able to get flying hours up, to be able to restore our precision weapon stocks, which had been allowed to dwindle, to increase our weapon system sustainment, so, which is what we call the money for maintenance and logistics. And so, uh, so the agreement of the Congress and the president's commitment to restore the defense capability of this country is, is bringing a tremendous benefit to the United States Air Force. But remember, we have returned to an era of great power competition. We have an adversary that is rapidly modernizing. I mean, if you look at, you know, just take two events out of the news in the last month. Um, Russia conducted its largest uh, exercise on its own soil that, it, that it's conducted in four decades. 300,000 troops, 1,000 aircraft, um, China, this last year, commissioned its first aircraft carrier, steamed into the Pacific and began carrier operations. They have located bombers on islands in the, the South China Sea. So, so we are, have returned to an era of great power competition and we have to look not only at where we are in a fight against violent extremism, but where the world demands us to, to what, what's demanded of us and what we must prepare for. So our first priority is to restore the readiness of the force we have, but we also have an obligation to look long-term at what are the threats that are emerging. So unemployment is at a historic low. So how will the Air, Air Force compete with private companies uh, for all the highest potential Americans and also uh, have a diverse force? Hmm. You know, with respect to, to recruitment, the Air Force is doing okay now. We watch this really carefully uh, because uh, you know, unemployment is, is at historic lows and we are looking for the best of the best. Um, I, I know there are two naval folks up here, um, but we're still looking for the best of the best. Uh, so so uh, we, are, we are doing okay with respect to recruitment today. I would say that we are facing challenges in retention. Uh, not overall, we're meeting our goals overall, but in some specific areas, cyber is one. 
Uh, battlefield airmen is another, but the most significant one is aircrew. Uh, at the end of last year, we were about 2,000 uh, air pilots short. And, uh, and there's a couple of factors here. The most obvious one is we have a national shortage of aircrew. Uh, the airlines are hiring. Last year, I think they hired about 4,500 uh, pilots into commercial aviation. Just had a summit a couple of weeks ago with the Department of Labor, Secretary Chow, the head of the FAA, Dan Elwell, and then a bunch of industry people. It was really interesting to me that there, were, there was a group of uh, communities there uh, with a, a representative of a group of communities of rural air service. There are 37 communities in America that have lost their rural air service, bec not because there aren't companies to be willing to serve them, but because they can't get the air crew to fly the, the flights. So this is a national shortage of air crew. It impacts us because the, uh, the airlines come and try to hire pilots at the 10 or 12 year point from us. And, uh, and they're offering very good salaries. Our response to that has been really threefold. The first is to improve the quality of service for those who are in the military. So that we want to be the place where anyone in their right mind would want to stay. You know? um, and it's quality of service and quality of life for the, for the families of our, of our airmen. So things like we, we looked at all of our requirements for overseas duty and cut by about a third the number of 365 day remote tours overseas requiring a, a pilot to be in them. So, so reduce that demand uh, uh, for overseas remote tours. Uh, we, uh, we're putting people back into the squadrons to support the squadrons because that's where life happens. It's in the squadron. That, uh, that you need to make sure that, that the quality of service and quality of leadership is there. Um, on the training side, so recruitment is part of it, and some of it's bonuses and those kind of things. A lot more of it is about control. So, so letting airmen generally, but pilots specifically, have a little more control and choice about their careers, starting a fly-only track. So we're, we're testing that in Air Mobility Command with a a group of about 15 airmen who said, you know, I, I don't want to be on the command track. I don't want to go to service school and all those things. I just want to fly. And allowing that, allowing airmen to do that and stay and do what we really do need them to do. So retention is part of it. Um, another part of it is production of pilots. We've actually increased the production of pilots. Uh, we, we, uh, in fiscal year 16, we trained about 1,100 pilots. Uh, in fiscal year 19, our projection is about 1,300, and we're growing to about 1,400 in fiscal year 20, and then after that, about, about 1,500 a year. So ramping up pilot production and then keeping it there at a steady state. So retention is part of it, production is part of it, and overall, we think the nation has an acute shortage of of, uh, of pilots and air crew, and we need to find a way, working with industry, to make it possible for the next generation of young aviators to get to the cockpit. You know, a few years ago, I hosted another uh, Air Force secretary who said that there would be no need for pilots in the future because it would all be drones, so. I guess that was wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I, I get the sense that this is a big airplane uh, crew here, aircraft, because I have about 50 airplane questions. So let's get started on that. How will the Air Force decide which aircraft will be needed for the new squadrons? What factors will be the most important? Will it be costs? Will it be pure rivals? Mm -hmm. Let me first take, take your, 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 you don't need pilots because you'll have drones. What you have in that case is a remotely piloted aircraft. You still have to have someone who understands how to fly that aircraft. And so, so uh, in fact, the Air Force now has over 300 remotely piloted aircraft. In 1991, when we went to, to war in the Gulf, when the Air Force went to war and never came home, at that time, the United, in all of the United States Air Force, there were eight remotely piloted aircraft. So it has really expanded substantially. Uh, it's just that uh, the pilot is not sitting in the cockpit. So we still need those airmen. Now I'm going to have to remember what you asked. Oh, how do we decide what kinds of aircraft? Um, uh, we are not at the 
point yet of saying, all right, we need this type and these number of tails and, and those kinds of things. We actually are required to, to go deeper in our analysis for the final report that we'll be giving in March, and we'll, we'll be trying to do that for the, for the final report. A lot of questions about the F-35s. Uh, will, do you expect an increase or decrease in the number of F-35s? The Air Force has proposed, I'm trying to, I'm going to blank on the actual number, but it's over 1,000 over time of the, uh, of the F-35A version that, uh, that the Air Force is, is uh, buying and deploying. Uh, we now have over 100,000 hours, I think, on, our, uh, on the F F-35A. It is a game-changing aircraft. Uh, it's, it's a computer wrapped in a stealthy aircraft, and it's, it is it's not really about the aircraft anymore. Uh, the F-35 is much more about the entire, it, they're the quarterback, and it's changing the way in which airmen uh, are able to fight and, and operate. The, uh, the chief, Dave Goldfein, was, was out in, at Nellis at one of the exercises, and he was watching this young, it was actually a Marine Corps captain who was, who was briefing the mission, and and it was amazing that he started out talking about space and then cyber and how all he had put his whole campaign and operation together for that exercise. He got 10 minutes into the briefing before he even got to the air picture. Then when he put on his helmet and fired, you know, as soon as they fire up the jet, it's pulling in data from everywhere. Um, when he's out at the end of the runway, he's already monitoring the impact of the cyber operation so, and adjusting his plan accordingly. It is a very different way of fighting and enables, uh, enables tremendous capability. With respect to how many, our plan has not changed. Um, with respect to how many per year, the, the, uh, you know, the Defense Department is currently in the, in the process of finishing up its version of the budget to go forward to OMB for the FY20 uh, budget proposal. And of course, that'll, that'll come out with the President's budget in, in February for what we plan for next year, but overall, um, over a thousand F-35As is the uh, is the Air Force intention currently. So speaking of the Marines, uh, there have been some reports that the Marines are going to fly their F-35B in the coming days in their first combat mission. Uh, any word on when the Air Force might do its first combat mission with the F-35A? You know, I read about the F-35B in the paper this morning as well, um, and I, I marked down my so my book so the. Uh, the three service secretaries get together, we get together for breakfast every two weeks, and then we sometimes get together on the weekends with our spouses to have dinner. We actually get along very well, which is, I guess historically has not been the case, but um, <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a lot of good fun in it. And, and, uh, and uh, this next week, I think, will be particularly interesting as the Air Force Navy game is coming up. So, so there will be pranks in the Pentagon. Um, but I, I wrote that down in my book to, uh, to ask Richard Spencer about, but I, I actually don't know the answer of, uh, I, I wanted to see what his plans are with respect to the F-35B. But with respect to what aircraft are going into combat, obviously we don't talk about that until after it's over. Okay, good answer. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to the KC-46A. The first delivery of the KC-46A is now scheduled for October 27th. That's more than a year late, and there's risk that unresolved deficiencies could push it back even farther. Boeing has lost more than $3.5 billion on the original fixed price deal. As you approach the award of another fixed price development contract for a new training jet later this week, what lessons do you hope the Air Force and the winning TX contractor take away from the KC-46A experience? There's about four questions embedded in that question, I think, <laughs> and, and a few other presumptions. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the KC-46. We are working with Boeing and trying to drive forward to get the delivery of that aircraft, and it has to do, it has to do several things. It has to fly really well, it has to be able to protect itself, it has to communicate, and it has to tank. And we are doing the testing, as, as, you know, we, we put, set with Boeing a very aggressive but achievable schedule to get through all of that and be able to deliver the first of the four operational test aircraft 
uh, by October. We're still trying to drive toward that, but we're still getting the, the test reports in and making sure that any deficiencies are taken care of or that Boeing commits to take care of them at Boeing's expense even while we, we do operational tests and evaluation. But we're driving through those. This is why we do testing. Um, is, uh, is to make sure that it, uh, that it works and that, that all the kinks are, are worked out of the aircraft. And, um, and uh, when it's ready, we will accept it. So what will uh, the Air Force do to ensure that the Boeing delivers the Huey replacements on time? You know, it's only a day after we did the contract <laughs> announcement. Uh, uh, the, in, the intention there is to, is to uh, work with Boeing. Um, this, is, uh, this is not all that, I, we don't think this is a complicated procurement. The first part on the, the engineering work on some of the things that they're gonna have to do to modify the aircraft that they're talking about using, they'll move through that. Um, and then we expect to buy 84 of them. The, the, Huey, uh, the Huey replacement, there's a, there's a history to this one. Um, and I learned it when I came here. You know, there, were, there was an intention to try to buy some right off the line, but there are other companies who are interested in bidding. Um, it, we were uh, uh, really required, and the previous administration decided, and I think they were right, that we were required to do a competition. We couldn't just buy it off the line. And as it turns out, I think that probably was the right decision. It wasn't, it wasn't a decision I made. It was made by my predecessor. But because of that competition, uh, Boeing uh, won the competition at a significantly lower price point. Um, and, um, and so uh, I think the taxpayer is going to get a good deal out of that. And the Air Force will get a replacement for the aging Hueys for both the the missile fields and for out here at Andrews. Okay, returning to the KC-46 for just a second, uh, will the issues with that, K with that uh, tanker change the way you see using commercial derivatives for military aircraft? I don't think it changes the way we think about commercial derivatives. I do think that the, that the, the commercial platform uh, the chief of staff went out and flew the aircraft. I don't know how he, he, he gets the good deals sometimes. <laughs> he went out, went out uh, General Goldfein went out and, and met with Boeing, but also went up and, and flew the aircraft. And this is an aircraft that is designed to be able to fly steady without spilling people's coffee in the back. And he said it is a very smooth aircraft. That is also the same characteristic that you want for a tanker. You, and he's, uh, the chief is, a, is an F-16, um, pilot F-117 and several other airframes, but, but what you really want in a tanker is it flying at a constant speed, constant altitude, so that you're not trying to, to match that aircraft coming in to tank. You just want, them, just want them smooth and not spilling the coffee. And it's a very similar kind of profile from a, from a flight profile. So as, if, with respect to how the aircraft flies, that's a very good, uh, very good way to have have purchased the equipment rather than designed something new. Well, as someone who has refueled in the air, I really, I second that requirement. <laughs> Pass the drama mean. Do you think the Air Force needs a stealth aerial tanker to support stealth fighters? Uh, that's not part of our, that's not part of our current plan. In the wake of the loss of, of a reconnaissance aircraft due to apparent friendly fire by Syrian air defenses, Russia has announced plans to provide Syria with a more capable S-300, which experts say is effective against fourth generation fighter aircraft. How does this move change your assessment of the threat facing aircraft such as the A-10, F-16, F and F-15 as they support actions on the ground against ISIS forces in Syria? So that's an easy question. No, it's not. Um, and I, uh, I, I am the Secretary of the Air Force. My responsibility is to organize, train, and equip Air Force to present ready forces to a combatant commander who fights. It is not my role to talk about, and I think it would probably would be inappropriate for anyone to talk publicly about how we might deal with a particular threat. Um, but, uh, but it's also not my I'm the Secretary of the Air Force, I'm not a combat commander, and I'm not a, 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 a combat pilot, and so it would be inappropriate for me to even speculate on that. 
All right, so let's move on to the Space Force. Uh, former Secretary of the Navy Sean O'Keefe described the Space Force as a solution desperately searching for a problem. You said in a recent speech that we have the responsibility to develop a pros proposal for the President that is bold and that carries out his vision for a new Space Command. What exactly is his vision as you understand it? Let me talk a little bit about what we do in space, and then what the what the challenge is. So, we, you know, what is the what is the the problem and the challenge that we need to address? So, what do we do in space? Now we've got about I guess about seven missions: weather, new weather from space, missile warning. So, we uh, we detect missiles launched. Um, we we do that from space. GPS. That's uh, of our of the Air Force's 77 satellites on orbit. A uh, little over 30 of them are GPS, so, so position, what we call, the airmen call it position navigation and timing. Everybody else knows it as the blue dot on your phone. So, so uh, GPS. Uh, communications, a lot of communications, command and control done through space. Launch, the United States Air Force does launch for, uh, for all of the, uh, uh, we do it uh, uh, from Cape Canaveral, but we buy launch services for all of our all of our satellites. And then intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So we do that from space, and we do that in partnership. You know, the National Reconnaissance Office is, uh, was, for, for a very long time, for decades, was, a, was an unacknowledged program inside of the Air Force um, that was a partnership initially between the CIA and the Air Force. So intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And the final one is space superiority. I would say, that six of those seven, the United States is the best in the world. That we are the best in the world at space. The area where we think we are being challenged and where we have to focus is on space superiority. That is the problem that we need to address. And so I believe we have to be the best at space overall. Um, the President's 2019 budget accelerated defendable space, and the, the, uh, there was not much controversy or discussion of that publicly. There was very broad agreement on Capitol Hill that we needed to increase the amount of money we were putting in to space capabilities to be able to defend what we have on or orbit. As a result, we canceled, um, we call them space-based infrared, our missile warning satellites, our seventh and eighth missile warning satellites. We canceled those and accelerated to a new missile warning sensor that, uh, that's more defendable. So think uh, smaller chaff and flares, more maneuverable to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, as we say, take a punch and keep on operating. So the fiscal year 19 president's budget accelerates defendable space. In February, the president will send his fiscal year 20 budget to Capitol Hill, and we expect that that will include a proposal for a department. That's going to require action from the Congress to create all of the authorities needed to, for a new department to organize, train, equip, and develop separate and, and, and be a successful department. I don't think we need to wait um, to uh, continue to accelerate depend defendable space, and the Air Force is not. We are working with the Joint Staff under the guidance of the Secretary of Defense to reestablish a warfighting command that puts the warfighters' focus on space operations. We used to have a combatant command for Space Command, and, and that was actually authorized by the Congress, and, uh, and we're moving forward with a warfighting command. But we're also accelerating acquisition and buying things faster and smarter. It is my view that the president has brought space into the spotlight. He's made it kitchen table conversation. And that benefits this country. And, uh, and so that's where I think we are. So I think perhaps the controversy arises when we talk about a separate space command as a separate department. Um, it's billions of dollars, it's thousands of people. The Air Force Association opposes it, says that the the Air Force and the Space Command belong together. Um, and, and congressional critics have said that setting up a, a sixth branch will create um, sort of duplicative bureaucracy. What's the case for a separate department? The, uh, 
the, there are differing views in the Congress. There are actually uh, 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 proponents of it in the Congress as well. And I think the president will put forward his concept for a new department and the, the elected members of the Congress as well as the president and the vice president who are elected to make these decisions will consider that proposal um, and probably debate it on both sides. Uh, uh, and, and make a decision. My responsibility and the Air Force's responsibility is to help shape and put forward a concept that if approved will help advance our ability to be able to prevail in space and, and continue to be the best in the world at space. So, so that is the, the approach that the, the Air Force has taken to try to make sure that, uh, that we put forward put forward a concept that carries out the president's bold vision um, to be able to deal with that, remember that seventh element, which is space superiority. We're already the best in the world at all the rest. So how do we make sure that we're the best at space superiority and dominant in space? And I think the president has really brought this to the fore and I think that that's great for the country. The United States had a unified U.S. Space Command from 1985 to 2002, but it was eliminated after September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks, and many of its functions were merged into the U.S. Strategic Command. Why not reconstitute that function? In fact, we are reconstituting that function. So the War Fighting Command, a sub-unified command, was authorized in the National Defense Authorization Act that passed last summer. Uh, and we're moving forward with that. I think people are, are also willing forward to move forward with a fully unified command. Uh, and the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, under the guidance of the, of the Secretary of Defense, are moving forward with the establishment of that warfighting command, much as the Joint Chiefs of Staff are responsible and, and did set up Cyber Command as a separate warfighting command. So we are moving back, you know, I, the, at, in 2002, um, it was a different time and a different world. I mean, we were facing, uh, we were in the wake of a terrorist attack. Uh, it wasn't until 2007, 2007 or 2008, uh, that uh, China launched a direct ascent anti-satellite weapon and demonstrated the ability to knock down a satellite. So they, they hit one of their own dead weather satellites, scattered about 3,000 pieces of debris into, into orbit and demonstrated the ability to destroy a satellite on orbit. Uh, that was a seminal moment, uh, and we, we need to, uh, we need to uh, reestablish, it seems to me, a warfighting command focused on, uh, on space and, and warfighting. Colorado Springs is already lobbying for the new space command. Colorado Congressman Doug Lamborn tweeted yesterday that he had made the case to you. Where do you think such a command would be best located and what factors will you consider? And, and have you spoken to Jeff Bezos about that? <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, I, uh, one of the things you do as the Air Force Secretary is host people who come to the Pentagon to visit. I think today it was uh, Little Rock, Arkansas and uh, Abilene, Texas came by, but uh, Colorado Springs uh, city leaders and, and uh, kind of city, city mothers and fathers came by earlier in the week. And obviously they, uh, they're very interested in having that command in Colorado. It, because it's a unified command, that decision is, the, is made by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, not the Secretary of the Air Force. All right, definitely a way to get off the hook. <laughs> All right, so this is from our foreign press. What role do you envision for the Air Force in maintaining security in the Asia Pacific arc of instability? The national defense strategy recognizes the reemergence of great power competition. And obviously, uh, the, uh, the, what we're seeing as far as Chinese development and innovation uh, and what they are doing in the Pacific is a, is a cause for concern. One of the things that the national defense strategy guides us to do is not only to restore the readiness of a force and increase the lethality of the force, but I think for the first time that I remember, our national defense strategy actually calls out the importance of alliances and partnerships. And I don't recall that being a, a central element of our national defense strategy in, in previous iterations. The, 
the strategy recognizes those alliances as a strategic advantage for the United States, that we're stronger together, and that America has allies. We, there are countries around the world that want to be allied with the United States of America, and that is a strength. And, uh, and so, uh, the, the, interestingly, in the, you, know, you look at Central Command, um, I think we now have 27, 28 partners in Central Command in the fight against ISIS uh, and in Afghanistan. Uh, I was meeting with the Latvians yesterday. That's another um, thing that I get to do is to meet with our, our counterparts from other countries. Latvia sent some of their military forces to Afghanistan, partnered with the Michigan National Guard. So these connections between military forces go deep and often they come together first in the air. Because other countries and other partners, uh, in other, um, other parliaments have sometimes the same challenges we do as Americans, where you might be reluctant to put people on the ground in harm's way, but contributions to the air campaign may be something that's, that's more doable. Uh, and as airmen, we're used to operating in a multinational coalition kind of way. The air, air and space is just kind of that way. So, so often the coalition comes together first in the air. We have very deep partnerships and, uh, and alliances, not only with our Five Eyes partners, with, with, uh, but with, uh, with multiple countries around the world. I would also add that we're also doing things to try to make things inherently easier to partner. Um, one of them is what we're doing with the light attack experiment, M looking at a light attack aircraft that not only is exportable from the very beginning, but rides on a network that we can fully share. So that, uh, that the information system that connects the joint tactical air controller on the ground with the aircraft and with the air operations center to share information is, is exportable from the beginning so that we can share that with partners and allies without any restriction on export controls. Okay, so we are about to get to the last question, but before I do, I wanna take a moment to let the audience know about some of our upcoming events at the National Press Club. On Thursday, September 27th, the National Press Club Politicians versus the Press Spelling Bee. 7 p.m., it's really a fantastic event. Um, you'll, you'll see who, who uses spell check and who doesn't. Um, <laughs> September 28th, a headliners newsmaker featuring sp uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan, and also a headliners newsmaker with the President of the Republic of Slovenia. On Tuesday, October 2nd, here in the Holman Lounge, we will have a headliners luncheon with the Director General of Al Jazeera. And on Friday, October 5th, we have a Headliners Book and Breakfast event with MSNBC's uh, Steve Kornacki. And now, uh, with the final uh, question, will the new Air Force Ones, uh, will the new Air Force Ones be painted red, white, and blue? I do not know, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I, I have to say, I'm so glad that you didn't ask me a spelling bee question. <laughs> so I, I, was, I admitted this to Kevin on the way in, that I gave up spelling for Lent in like fourth grade, <laughs> and I, I, never, I never went back to it. So thank you all very much. We'd like to thank the Air Force Secretary for coming here today and taking so much time to answer our mountain of questions. I didn't get to uh, one of the crucial ones, which was, what is your favorite aircraft? As I said, this is a really big sort of <laughs> flight-oriented audience here. But we'd like to thank you for coming and present you with this National Press Club mug. Thank you again for attending today and we are adjourned.